Uh, my name is Michelle Schilling, and I'm the Assistant Clinical Director for Families and Youth, and I'm going to be talking about attachment today. So I'd like to start with a little bit about myself. Um, I have been in practice in the Las Cruces community for about 15 years now. Um, and I have really devoted a lot of my time to specializing in trauma and attachment um, because I see the need for it. And we also see so much healing come from doing the what's underneath. So the trauma and attachment work is just really important to get underneath the issues. Um, so what I'd like to start with to also regulate myself is a calming tool. <clears throat> so I do calming tools before all of my presentations because the neuroscience supports that every time we change activities throughout the day, our brain dysregulates. So our brain is going to get really dysregulated today. Uh, because we're going to be bouncing around from presentation to presentation, and every time we move, our brain is getting more dysregulated. So what happens if we don't regulate ourselves throughout the day is we, when we get off work, we're exhausted. Um, I know when I'm not doing good self-care throughout the day, I'm coming home, falling asleep on my couch, and then I know I didn't take good care of myself that day. So we all fall off the self-care wagon. Um, and when we're stressed, that's when we need to do more self-care, really. Um, what I do notice when I'm doing breathing exercises in between all of my appointments throughout the day is I stay more energized. I have energy maybe to do some chores at home when I get home, maybe do the dishes, um, do some activities besides laying on the couch. Um, because I have the brain and body are working together in harmony when we're regulating throughout the day. So what I have here is a calming tool that I'd like us all to participate in. So if everyone can get relaxed in their chairs with your feet on the ground, you can close your eyes if you're comfortable and just breathe. And I'm going to ask that you inhale through the nose for four seconds and exhale through the mouth for eight seconds. Go ahead and inhale. Hold, exhale. Inhale. Hold, exhale. Inhale, hold, exhale. And one more inhale, hold and exhale. Opening your eyes when you're ready. And would anyone like to share anything they noticed? Yes. I noticed my, my lungs filling up and deflating with the air, so that was really like being in the here and now. Yes, it brought you back to your body. It helps with that body awareness. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Any other experiences? Yes. Thank you, Cynthia. I feel definitely calmer. Um, as many years as I've been presenting, I still have performance anxiety at times. <laughs> so it's very helpful for me to do the calming exercises before the presentations as well. And I highly recommend doing regulation exercises throughout the day. I've, I've, I also recommend this in the school setting um, when kids are changing classes, if they can do um, exercises with the teachers before each class starts, that can help the entire classroom to become more regulated. 
<clears throat> something really important about emotional regulation is that trauma and attachment disruption get in the way of our brain's ability to regulate. So we see that often where kids are not able to calm down, where they're not able to downshift. And that is because we as the adults have to model and help children to co-regulate so that they can download how to self-regulate at some point. Um, the child can never outregulate the adult. So if an adult is very dysregulated, a child is not gonna be able to regulate. So that is, that is really critical in doing attachment and trauma work, is that we have to check in with our bodies and see if we're regulated. All right. I'm going to start with, with a definition of attachment. And I'm using the um, definition from Bowlby. John Bowlby is actually considered the father of attachment. He was a psychoanalyst who developed attachment theory. And Bowlby's definition... Hmm. I'm trying to see where I should look, actually. is defined as a strong emotional tie that bonds one person intimately with another person. Attachment is also a behavior system through which humans regulate emotional distress, such as being threatened. And attachment starts actually developing in utero during pregnancy. So that's really important. Attachment comes online in the brain in the last trimester in utero. So when you think about women who have stressful pregnancies, women who may be in abusive relationships, there are a lot of stress hormones that can release during that pregnancy that can impact attachment. The good news is that attachment spans across the entire lifespan. So we can continue to work on secure attachment and being able to trust others throughout our entire lives. So even if we had a particular attachment style in our earlier life as children, we can have what we call corrective experiences where we can then develop secure attachment. And those corrective experiences are when the brain notices something different. When the brain notices, oh, this adult is helping me, has helped me every day. Maybe not all adults will hurt me. Those are important corrective experience for, experiences for our children to have. Any questions before I uh, move on to my next slide? And just a heads up, I like to be very interactive, so I like a lot of participation. No questions? Okay. This is an illustration of an attachment cycle derived from several psychoanalysts. So as I mentioned, attachment starts developing in utero. So once a baby's born, those first two years of life are critical. According to Erickson's psychosocial stages of development, trust versus mistrust is coming online in the brain in the first two years of life. So we start with baby in the crib. So when an infant feels discomfort, the infant cries and expresses a need. What should the adult do at that time? Respond. And what's the difference between responding and reacting? Yes, thank you. Responding, when we are able to respond, we are regulated. We are in our regulated body. 
When we react, we are dysregulated and we can go into our survival brain where we can go into that fight, flight, freeze. So something important in working with infants is always check your body first. Am I regulated? Check to make sure you're regulated and then respond. So then the parent responds and meets the need. And then the infant is comforted and the need is met. So if this attachment cycle repeats again and again, this infant will develop secure attachment, meaning that this child will learn that they can trust others. And children who come into the world who learning how to trust show up very different in the world than children who come into the world not trusting adults. Comments, feedback. All right. Yes, ma'am. So did everybody, when that thing was going on with Dr. Spock, and, right, he was telling you to leave your baby in a room and like let him yeah. cry it out, right? Is that way, did everybody in that generation develop anxious attachment or what? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is a wonderful question, and I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, yes. So um, the Ferber method, right? Uh, let the babies cry it out. Uh, this is very illustrated. How many of you guys have seen Meet the Fockers? Love that movie. Love Ben Stiller and Robert De Niro. So that, the Ferber method was being used by Robert De Niro in that movie. To, for the baby to learn to self-soothe, right? So now, years later, we're finding, oh, you're not supposed to let the baby cry in the crib. Uh, that child is going to develop attachment issues. So that's not good news, right? But a lot, but I mean, here we are with conflicting knowledge around that, where uh, the Ferber method was a thing. And many people followed the Ferber method, um, the good news is, if any of you did follow the Ferber method, it can still shift. <laughs> we can develop attachment across the entire lifespan. Thank you for that question. Any other feedback? I'm also going to be talking about my attachment style as a child, uh, which is anxious attachment. So we'll go into that in a little while. <laughs> This is an example of a disturbed attachment cycle. So it starts with baby experiencing a discomfort or need. The baby cries. The mother or, or parent does not respond to the baby's cry or else responds inconsistently. Might respond sometimes, might not respond other times. The baby cries louder as the child is not getting their need met. Baby eventually gives up. Trust does not develop. Rage or apathy develop instead. Baby plays with self or becomes apathetic. Baby rests. So what happens here is the child is learning I cannot rely on adults to help me out. I cannot rely on adults to help me get my needs met. So this is where insecure attachment develops. How many of you are familiar with the infant studies done by R Dr. Renee Spitz in the 50s? Okay. So Dr. Renee Spitz did uh, research on infants in orphanages and because there were so many babies, infants did not always get response, did not always get nurtured, held. Sometimes bottles were propped up. And so the research that Dr. Renee Spitz did was he basically documented that the infants were deteriorating by not having nurturing. They were developmentally delayed, um, it's it's a very it's actually the video is actually on um, YouTube. I, I remember 
seeing the video in a training with a bunch of therapists and we were all just crying <laughs> in the training because it, it's really it's really amazing like how how much it can impact when you're not nurtured and how that really negatively impacts the brain. So what we do is we, when children have developed this for a long time and when the disturbed attachment cycle has been repeated over and over again, then they show up in the world differently. They try to get their needs met on their own instead of using their words to ask for their wants and needs. In the Renee Spitz study, one of, some, a couple of the infants were rocking themselves in their cribs. They were self-soothing, right? And that's this baby plays with self. So they're actually trying to learn regulation. They're rocking themselves back and forth. I've seen this with older children who will rock in session and rock back and forth because they haven't had an adult to co-regulate and rock with them. Um, I always recommend to my parents, you know, if they have a rocking chair, if they can, if they see a, a young child or an older child even um, rocking themselves, then they are dysregulated and they are, they, and if they're not securely attached, they may be scared to ask for their wants and needs. Because when a child has insecure attachment, there is a lot of fear about asking adults for help. And that's why we see a lot of disorganized behaviors come up around that. Um, comments or feedback or questions on any of that? Yes, ma'am. So just because it says in, in your uh, slide here, it, not, it can be also an adolescent. Absolutely. What I'm going to be presenting today are on the different attachment styles. And, and one thing I'm going to hit on particularly is disorganized attachment. And when a child has disorganized attachment, those are the kiddos that are at risk of homelessness. Those are the kiddos that are at risk of um, legal issues, juvenile probation, prison. Um, you know, in, in the keynote this morning, we were talking about it was uh, the increase in crime was discussed. We've got to get underneath that. These kiddos are disorganized and they need help in learning how to trust adults. And we need to be able to get underneath the behavior so that we can um, shift things in the community. Thank you. Any other feedback? All right. So I'm going to talk about an insecure attachment. When a child develops a secure attachment, it presents as a healthy bond. In other words, they learn to expect the best from the other person and believe they have a good heart. In people with insecure attachment, the expectation is the opposite. They expect the other person to abandon them or harm them in some way. So we see that with our kiddos that come into custody. A lot of our kiddos have abandonment issues, right? Where that does show up in their behavior. And so we really try to the key to working on this is working with the parents. So I've worked with a lot of foster parents, pre-adoptive parents, the biological parents. If, if my team is going in and doing attachment work, they're working with all the systems. They're working concurrently with the biological parent, doing parallel parenting with the foster parent or pre-adoptive parent. The child cannot outregulate the adult. We have to have the adults in play in order to do the attachment and trauma work. That is critical. In our outpatient program at Families and Youth, we provide what I consider enhanced outpatient services because we provide weekly parent sessions as well as individual and family sessions. So we have those parent sessions with the parents to 
really get under what's coming up in the home, what's working, what's not working. And we're really helping them to bond, to connect, to help the child learn to trust. What is tricky in that is that a lot of our kiddos who have especially disorganized attachment, a lot of the time have parents who have disorganized attachment. And so those parents did not get their needs met. And so I always tell my clinicians, you cannot expect the parent to provide to the child what you can't provide to the parent. The clinician has to stand in the gap as a temporary attachment figure for that adult so that they can model secure attachment, secure relationships. And then we help, we come alongside the parent in modeling and doing together so that they learn, so that they can start working on their own secure attachment. Because if we don't help the parent, we can't help the child because the child will never be able to outregulate the adult. Um, questions, comments, feedback. Michelle, can you give some examples of what anxious, avoidant, and disorganized could look like? Yes, I'm actually going to go into those in more detail. No, no worries. So yes, um, so, these, the, so the types of insecure attachment are anxious, avoidant, and disorganized. So I'm going to first talk about anxious attachment. Anxious attachment can develop if the child has experienced parents as sometimes being there for them and sometimes not being there. This causes intense anxiety in children. Children may react by being whiny, clingy, demanding, or have angry outbursts. These children are trying to get their needs met for comfort and express their distress. So this is the inconsistent that you saw in the earlier diagram. That the infant is sometimes getting their need met and sometimes there's not the responding. So it's, it's inconsistent. So children who have anxious attachment need extra reassurance, giving constant reinforcement, even when it doesn't seem like it should be necessary. Telling them many times every day that they are loved and cared for and giving lots of praise whenever they are being good will help build up a sense of security. So making sure we, we also, it's not just about reassuring and praising. It's also about making sure the child is taking that in. Because with a lot of our kiddos who have extensive trauma and attachment disruption, they are a lot of the times in their survival brain, in their fight, flight, freeze, reptilian brain. So when that brain is online, their higher functioning brain is offline. It has an out to lunch sign. There's not, when a child is dysregulated, you never ask for recall. They will get more triggered because they cannot do it. They have to be regulated in order to go into their higher functioning brain where they can process. So, I myself was an anxious attached child. Um, I come from a family of alcoholism. And so some days were safe in my home and some days were not safe in the home. And I didn't know which days were going to be safe and which days weren't going to be safe. So there was that inconsistent where you didn't know what was, what was going to be. And I've worked on that for a lot of years, but the anxious attachment stuff can still come up here and there, for sure. Because we can t our healing process is, is ongoing, and it's always important to continue that personal work. So I always recommend to my clinicians, you know, that our, our own personal work is really important. Because a lot of us attracted to the field have our own stories. We have our own wounding. And... And what, I try, and what we try to do at Families and Youth is, is really take away that stigma and shame around wounding. Because 
my argument would be that most, most people have trauma. Whether it's a divorce, car accident, abuse, neglect. I mean, everyone has had attachment disruptions, deaths in the family. Everyone goes through disruption. And so everyone has wounding. And if we're not noticing what's coming up for us, then we can't stand in the gap because the child can't outregulate us. So if I become dysregulated in a session, I will say to my families, like, hey, you know, things are, this is getting, this is getting really tough. Like, let's take a little break. Let's take a breathing break. And I'll, sometimes that's for my benefit <laughs> because I'm getting dysregulated and I know that if I don't get back in my body and I'm not regulated, I'm not going to be able to provide the best care possible. And quality of care is, of anybody who knows me knows that that is utmost importance to me. I want to make sure we provide the best quality of care possible. I want to give a case example of anxious attachment. I had worked with a nine-year-old boy who was living with his grandparents. And he was, he, he had, to, his mom was sometimes in his life, sometimes not. So he was developing that anxious attachment. He had really intense separation anxiety. So anytime one of his grandparents would leave the house, he would melt down. You're, you might not come back. You're going to leave. It was very panicky, right? And so when I started working with the family, I said, well, what have, what have you guys been doing? And and they're like, well, one of us sneaks out of the house. <laughs> and so they were really on eggshells, right? It's like um, they were really struggling. And so what I had them do is I said, okay, so he's, he's going into his trauma brain a lot. So that means even though you guys are telling him you're keeping him safe, his brain isn't noticing it. We have to slow it down. So I had the parents prepare the, his brain to hear something that may not match what his experiences are. And they would say, I know it might be hard for you to believe, but, but we're going to keep you safe. And, and later in the day say, did you notice we kept you safe today? Yes. Right. So that very repetitive, as indicated here, there needs to be a ton of repetition to change the brain. Um, and the positive scans, too, because when a child or an, or an adult is stuck in survival brain, the brain is scanning for negative. The brain is scanning for danger. The brain is going to scan for the past experiences that match that narrative, right? So we've got to prepare the brain for something different, for a different experience. So the grandparents did that intervention multiple times a day for a few weeks. And we had a family session with the grandparents and the child. And I always ask my kiddos and my parents, where do you notice them different? What's different? And the little boy said, I notice my grandparents are telling me they're going to keep me safe a lot. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, oh, good, okay. And uh, we all kind of started laughing. And then he looked at me and tilted his head and he said, but do you know what? I said, what? He said, um, I, they've always told me that, but I believe them now. That was like what I call a miracle session. Um, and, and it's always when my therapists tell me about these sessions that I train, I just, I really make that big. I have my, my therapist talk about that in our group supervisions. We've got to make that big when we have those miracle sessions. When the child's brain notices, oh, wait a minute. I do believe them. That's huge. That's, that's the path of going towards secure attachment. Questions on anxious attachment? Oh, question? Oh, itching, itching. <laughs> no worries. We can do another regulation strategy. Any other feedback? Okay. Avoidant attachment. 
Avoidant attachment can develop if a child has experienced parents as being unresponsive and not being there to meet their basic needs. They handle their anxiety by suppressing it. The children may react by being aloof, distant, unusually independent, unaffectionate, showing indiscriminate friendliness towards strangers. These children are learning not to rely on others. So these are the kiddos. And sometimes this happens with disorganized attachment too, but kiddos with avoidant attachment as well, um, they'll ask any adult. So these are the kids that aren't really showing stranger danger. They're gonna throw a rock at any adult and see, what, see who's gonna help them out, right? Um, so what's important here with avoidant attachment of being respectful of why they have learned to be this way by not pushing them into emotional closeness or being too physically affectionate. A more gradual approach to getting close and not taking it as a personal rejection gives children a chance to learn that other people can be counted on. Unfortunately, in some cases, parents may have to adjust their own expectations or desires to accept the level of connection the children can give to them. So I worked with a TF, uh, treatment foster care family, and they were working with an adolescent girl. She's 14, and she was presenting with avoidant attachment characteristics. Her parent was a drug addict, meth and heroin, and so she did not experience response really from her mom. It was more absent. And so she is independent, very independent for her age. Um, we, we see that with a lot of our parentified kiddos, right? Where they're, very, where they're highly, highly independent at a very, very young age. She was the oldest, so she was actually raising her younger brothers for her mom. Um, so the TFC parents had taken the child to one of their family gatherings and they really wanted her to play with the family cousins and she didn't, she didn't want to um, because, you know, she, it takes her longer to get to know people. She has to go slower. She doesn't trust. So she was kind of getting pushed into emotional closeness there. Right, so she ended up kind of having a meltdown because she was not in a space to socialize, to hang out. And the parents did take that as a personal rejection, which the important piece there is we've really got to validate the parents. It is really tough when, when a parent tells me, I'm pouring everything I've got. I'm pouring everything I've got into this kid. Like what, and I'm like, it's gonna take time. We gotta move slow. We gotta make sure the brain is noticing. That is of critical importance. So I had slowed that down with the TFC parents and, um, and let them know like, okay, let's go back to, to what we know. That she does present with avoidant attachment characteristics. So that means that if she feels pushed into emotional closeness, she's going to get really triggered. So they were able to resolve that, and the parent was able to repair and reconnect with the child. That is really important in attachment. The attachment cycle is circular, and it is attachment, disruption, repair, reconnect. So we will always have attachment disruptions. We have to normalize that. There will always be disruptions, but what we need is the repair and reconnect to help the brain have a corrective experience. We need the repair and reconnect. It is of critical importance. Now this child is showing signs of secure attachment and is being adopted. And I'm super excited for her because she is a teenager being adopted, which is, is more rare, right? Um, but she's showing secure attachment characteristics. So some of the secure attachment characteristics we look for are, can the child use their words to ask for their wants and needs? Because that's what they would have learned in infancy, that when they cry out, an adult responds, right? Um, 
And for the most part, will they allow the adult to take charge of the environment? Developmental stuff aside, you know, terrible twos, adolescents. I mean, we have normal developmental stuff where we do see more pushback, right? But if it's at an extreme level, then we are seeing that the child is not presenting with a secure attachment. And third, the ability to emotionally regulate. That, that's our starting point. A starting point is emotional regulation. If we, aren't, if we can't help the family emotionally regulate, we're not gonna be able to do the, the deeper work. We have to start with the basics. Emotional regulation. I'd also like to talk about an experience I had of how powerful repair and reconnect can be. I was working with a 25-year-old male and um, his daughter was in custody. He had severely physically abused her. She had head-to-toe bruises. Um, it was very severe. And it, the plan was reunification. And so I was doing parent session with him and he was, I could tell in a lot of denial and probably wasn't feeling safe with me yet, right? And I said something to him and as soon as it left my mouth, I realized I came across in judgment. And that's because I was triggered, right? Because we're humans and that's part of the human experience. So that's important to normalize that as well, that that's going to happen in therapy and in, in whatever. And so I caught it as soon as it came out, but I didn't catch it fast enough. Um, he immediately escalated. I'm going to just run out and da, da, da. He just was very, very in my face, very escalated. And I started breathing. And then he just saw me start taking deep breaths. And I said, whoa, I said, I want, I, I'd like to apologize. And he kind of looked at me like, what? And I said, well, I said, I came across in judgment right now. And that's not my intention. My intention as the family's therapist is to try to, to, is to, try to help you guys to be safe together as a family. And, it, and I'm not here trying to judge you. And I apologize that I came across in judgment. Um, and then he sat back and he, and he said, Nobody's ever apologized to me before. That was huge. I was like blown away. Like, man, this man has never experienced repair in his life. He's never experienced the repair piece that needs to happen in the attachment cycle. Right? So I was then able to build a bridge of trust with him. He started talking to me about his trauma. He was severely abused himself and was able to say at one point in treatment, I lost it. I didn't mean to. I don't want to be abusive. I don't want to be like my mom. And that's how we s slow down or stop the abuse cycle. We have to get underneath it for the parents because if they can't, if, and if we can't create emotional safety for the parents, then we're not going to get there. Comments, feedback. Okay. Disorganized attachment. Disorganized attachment can develop if a child experiences parents as both frightening and dangerous, as well as sometimes a source of comfort. They may respond by being manipulative, sneaky, deceptive, showing superficial emotionality or fake sweetness. The children are trying to control and influence their parents to avoid being harmed, but also get their needs met. The children may appear to be driven primarily by meeting their own needs, even at the expense of others. So with disorganized kiddos, it's important to be firm and clear about expectations and follow through. 
the parents must be able to create emotional safety. So especially with children, I mean, this is important for all of our kiddos, but especially children with disorganized attachment, they need, their brains need to notice consistency. You say what you do, you say what you mean and mean what you say. So if we're even in treatment team meetings, I'll tell team members like, are we able to follow through on that if we're saying that? Because if we're not able to follow through on that, we can't say that. We have to follow through with anything we, if we're gonna say it, we've gotta follow through. Because uh, this child already doesn't trust anybody. And so we need to start building trust. And building trust is about creating emotional safety. And in order to create emotional safety, we have to be reliable. We have to be consistent. And, and when we're not consistent, it's important that we repair and reconnect that we weren't consistent because we can't be perfect, right? But the repair is how we get back online with the parents and the family. Now, these are the kiddos that are ending up in the legal system and homeless and ending up in the prison system. And our prisons, I mean, if, you, if we were to, to, you know, I mean, most people in prison have extensive trauma histories, extensive trauma histories, extensive attachment disruption. And so if we look at the characteristics of disorganized attachment, sneaky, manipulative, deceptive, those types of miscues lead to law-breaking behavior because those kids are trying to get their needs met but they don't know how to do it. So they're doing it their own way because they do not trust that adults can help them. These kiddos can be some of our hardest to work with. And part of the reason for that is that sneaky deceptiveness, manipulation, those are very triggering things, right? So if a parent is constantly getting manipulated, um, if that's happening, that's gonna be triggering the adult's attachment system. That's gonna be triggering survival brain for the adult. And so that is more challenging because I'm working with the parents like, okay, what's underneath that behavior? What, what might be the need there? What's the need they can't communicate? So we're trying to go underneath the behavior and go to the need. We're always, that's what we're always looking at is what is the behavior trying to communicate to us? They can't use their words to communicate it to us yet. Their behavior is communicating. Behavior is communication. What is it communicating? What do we need to do to get underneath? And what do we need to do to help, to, to help this, child, this child's brain notice that we are meeting the need? Um, a good example I have of that is um, a kiddo we worked with in foster care who had been in the foster home for uh, probably close to a year maybe. And so we had gotten the case a little bit later, but the child was still presenting with a lot of hoarding of food and was hiding food. And, and we see that a lot with, with kiddos in the system. Um, because uh, if their basic needs weren't met, then there, there's fear that, that they won't be able to get food, right? There's, there, there's fear of scarcity. And so they're going to, to do what they can to, to, for themselves, right? Um, so we were working with the foster parent, and we were trying to work out, okay, how can we go under this behavior, Right? Because a parent might go in and say, I already told you, you can't be hiding food in the room. There's going to be bugs. There's going to be this. You can't be doing that. Right? I mean, it's, that's, that's a typical response. How many times have I told you you can't have food in this room? Right? So one of the responses we worked on is having the parent regulate, go in the room, and when they do find food, whoa, thank you for letting me know that you're feeling worried about food. And some of the kids might, oh, I'm not, I'm not worried. Oh, it's okay. That's all right. I know it might be hard for you to believe, but we're going to make sure that you have food in this house. 
and then have the parent help the brain notice that they're getting consistent meals, they're getting consistent snacks, right? So that's a very different approach of going at the behavior or going underneath it. So that is what we are doing in our practice. Feedback, comments, questions. Yes, ma'am. Reactive attachment disorder developed from this particular type of attachment? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Reactive attachment disorder, you will see, comes out of disorganized attachment. And disorganized attachment is the hardest to treat, but it is treatable. We have been able to be successful with kids with disorganized attachment. The progress might be slower because, as you see here, there has been a lot of danger associated for these children. And so they're, they're, they're more likely to have those fear responses more often. Thank you for that question. Yes. Michelle, something dropped in for me when you were talking about that kiddo about the hoarding and eating food. When I worked for the schools, I often had a drawer full of snacks and food because, and I wish I had this training then, but I often had kiddos, teenagers, young teenagers, I worked, I worked in a middle school that would come into my office um, dysregulated, seeking food, seeking snacks, things like that. And it was often hard for me to relate to teachers that that I wasn't just um, spoiling them or, you know, um, giving them attention or, you know, the things that people would often name those behavior, attention-seeking behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, rather, I was trying to create trust, you know, that those kids knew that at some time during that day, at any time during the day, they could get food or water or whatever those things were. So I wondered if maybe you could speak to, I know there's some LCPS folks in the room. I've seen you guys kind of wandering around. And, just wondered if you could speak to some examples of how they can help, because a lot of them are not doing intensive work, but how could providers um, that are not doing the intensive work work to create the, that safety with their kiddos? Right. Thank you. No, thank you, Lisa, for bringing that up. Yeah, so in the school setting, um, it's, I mean, I, I know it's, it's challenging with full classrooms, so I'd, I'd love to get some feedback from teachers, but... Um, you know, like I said, we definitely want to do emotional regulation in between, you know, when they're coming back from recess before lunch. Um, I know it can be challenging with snacks because everybody, you know, we, there's, you know, fairness and all of those things. But if we can ever get underneath some of those things, um, like, I wonder, I wonder if you might be hungry. I wonder if you're, I wonder if you're feeling tired today. Right? So I always... The wonder questions are helpful because we're trying to get underneath the behavior, right? Now, remember, if you approach a child and you're dysregulated, even if you say the right words, it's going to kind of it's going to come across differently in your energy. So, what I find, which my heart goes out to teachers, is that it's harder to stay regulated when you've got a lot of dysregulated kids in the classroom. <laughs> It is harder. There's a lot of people in there. So that's why I recommend the regulation strategies in between even every hour. I mean, it took us probably 60 seconds to do that breathing exercise at the beginning of this training, right? So it can be quick and it can be regulating. And what I, what I also like about it is that it doesn't, a lot of our kiddos don't want to use their regulation strategies at school because they're, they'll very often say, the kids are going to be looking at me weird. I'm going to get judged. They're going to they're going to talk bad about me. But if we've got the whole classroom doing it, we don't have anybody. We don't have anybody singled out. So then we're able to just kind of make it a part of practice, because really, in my opinion, any agency school setting. Everybody should be practicing active emotional regulation throughout the day in their work settings. Absolutely. It would, it would change the game if we were integrating this in all settings. Because a lot of our kiddos, are uh, they spend a large majority of their time at school. So if we can come alongside and help them learn to regulate, that's going to help them survive 
in their home environment if that home environment is not quite safe yet. That's going to help their brain to be online more at school because when they're in fight, flight, when they're in fight, flight, freeze, they can't do logic. So then, so our kiddos with intense attachment and trauma disruption typically do poorly academically because they're not in that higher functioning brain in order to do academics. Um, any feedback from teachers? Okay. Yes, ma'am. I want us to consider as we're talking about how food insecurity and the idea of disorganized attachment is that we have a lot of teachers and ancillary staff that are also food insecure, and that was one of the things that always, for me, was sort of shocking when I first started hearing when the community and the schools had um, these cupboards, you know, full of food. and you know, teachers and EAs and just staff would come very secretively, right, to say, could you put the bag aside because, you know, whatever the situation may be for their own benefit. So I also want folks to know when you're thinking about kids and trying to regulate kids in the school, we have teachers and others that are in similar circumstances. So trying to sort of break down stigma around, around those things are really important. I'm so glad you brought that up. That is so important because if we can't create safety for the adults who are serving the children, then we're, we're not getting anywhere. We're stuck. And so that, that's a really great point. If we can really work on that stigma so that people can feel safe to use their words and communicate that they're not getting certain needs met, because we can't expect teachers to go in and regulate a classroom if they're not being supported, right? As, as, uh, as the assistant clinical director with my teams of clinicians, I tell them, I can't, I'm not gonna expect you to provide to those adults what I can't provide to you. If I'm asking you, if I'm going out and telling you to do this, then I'm, I need to make sure I'm creating the safety and doing that for, for you on your behalf. It has to come from, it has to come top down. So in companies, agencies, we've got to be able to create safety down the line. And really, you know, that's, that's one thing I'm working on is really the stigma that still exists with mental health. And I, I try really hard to normalize that with anybody I train. Like we all have mental health issues. We all have wounding. We all have trauma, most of us. I mean... So if we, can, if, if we can start normalizing things more, then people would be less scared to ask for help. Other questions, comments, concerns? Well, that's a wrap for me, guys. I appreciate your time. <laughs>